Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear faculty and students. My name is uh, Chris Christodoulados, and I'm Stevens' Vice Provost for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I would like to welcome you all to the Thomas H. Shaw Lecture by Visiting Entrepreneurs. This is a lecture series that was created with encouragement and financial support of Stevens' trustee, Thomas H. Shaw. Tom has been a champion of many innovation and entrepreneurship as well as research initiatives here at Stevens over the last few years. And with his work as, as uh, the president of the Research and Technology Commercialization Committee of the Board of Trustees has helped the Stevens community shift to a much more entrepreneurial academic culture and you know academics are very resistant to change. Uh, in addition to our invited speaker this afternoon, you will have the chance to attend a poster session where our Innovation and Entrepreneurship Summer Scholars and the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Doctoral Fellows will present their entrepreneurial ideas and projects. This event will be held in the Walker Gymnasium immediately following this afternoon's lecture. I would now like to invite Stevens President, Dr. Nariman Farvadin, to introduce our speaker, please relax and enjoy another exciting talk and learn how to fail less. Nariman. Thank you very much. Relax, relax indeed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted uh, to be here. I'm so happy to see so many familiar uh, faces, uh, some trustees, member of the faculty, uh, and of course, many, many students, young men and women who are aspiring entrepreneurs, right? Yes, indeed, I need a little more energy in this room. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as you all know, um, uh, this is uh, the Thomas H. Show Lecture by Visiting Entrepreneurs. I, I want to express my personal gratitude to uh, Tom Scholl, who's sitting up front. Uh, Tom, we are grateful to you for thinking of uh, this lecture series, for establishing this lecture series, for um, endowing this le lecture series, and for uh, putting your own heart and soul into it. Uh, Mr. Scholl lives in the Washington, D.C. area. He, he just arrived uh, half an hour, an hour ago um, from Washington just to attend this lecture, spend time with, with the students and the faculty, and of course with our speaker and uh, if I understand correctly, he's going back to DC tomorrow. Uh, as Dr. Christo Delados mentioned, uh, before I forget, I want to remind everybody that after the lecture, there will be a uh, poster session in Walker Gym, followed by, by a reception, but you've heard about the poster session. It covers uh, a whole span of uh, activities our students have been involved with, from robotics to healthcare to energy to sustainability and uh, to a whole host of um, different technologies, in particular those uh, applied to financial services. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, another good friend of mine, Mr. Simon Ninens, who is chairman and CEO of Wayside Technology Group, a company he joined in 1998. Wayside Technology Group is a unified and integrated technology company providing computing products and solutions to corporate IT organizations, government agencies, and even educational institutions. <clears throat> Prior to his current uh, role as the CEO of the company, Simon held various other positions at the company, including executive vice president, chief financial officer, and chief operating officer. Before Wayside, he worked for Ernst & Young in Amsterdam, Holland, the country that he is originally from. Uh, a mentor of technology entrepreneurs throughout uh, the state of New Jersey and very, very active in this area, Simon shared his own experiences to help business founders uh, avoid some of the pitfalls that he has encountered uh, throughout his career. For these efforts and for his dedication to the industry, he received the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year 2011 uh, New Jersey Award in the Technology Services category and the 2012 Public Company CEO of the Year Award from New Jersey Technology Council, a council where he's currently uh, serving as the chairman. Simon was named the Star Ledger Inside Jersey's 2014 100 plus club, a compilation of the most influential people in New Jersey. Um, when I grow up, I'd like to be able to join this club. Um, he was only one of five people recognized in the technology category. 
Uh, as I indicated, uh, Mr. Ninus is also a good friend and he is uh, now connected to Stevens in a variety of ways. Uh, just about uh, two weeks ago, uh, he was at Stevens. He brought a, um, a sizable group of high school students from Newark, New Jersey, just to visit our campus to be inspired by what happens at Stevens. They uh, took a tour of uh, Davidson Laboratory and they were uh, uh, amazed with uh, what our faculty and students do in that laboratory. In addition to that, uh, Simon was a guest speaker in my own course. Um, uh, many of you may know that uh, I teach a freshman level course to a group of pinnacle scholars and Simon was a guest speaker talking about leadership. And finally, he is a member of the President's Leader Leadership Council uh, in the university and he actually joined us in the first meeting of the council two days ago. The title of uh, Mr. Ninen's lecture is How to Fail Less, a topic that I am sure all of you and uh, myself included are uh, intensely interested in. So without further ado, I will ask Mr. Ninen's to come forward and share with us his wisdom. Simon. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank you. Hope this is checking if the, the mic works. Everybody can hear me? Good, then let's get started. Without further ado, I uh, try to entertain you and uh, hopefully you'll pick up a, a couple of lessons. So the current status when I joined the company in 98, it was uh, mostly a catalog company. And um, I came into the first meeting and they said, we really have an issue because there's oversupply. Uh, we're, we're a catalog company, but there are many catalog companies. So um, you can walk into a Walmart and there's, I don't know how many different choices of toothbrushes or shampoo. Um, so we all face it in our industry. We face oversupply, overcapacity, and then there's sensory overload. I mean, my, my Facebook, Twitter, I got a newspaper, I got the radio going, the news is going on and on and on. You can't walk into a bar without all CNN blaring at you. Um, so there's all that overload that leaves everybody confused. So what are we going to do? How are we going to stand out as a company? So how do you make a compelling offer to stand out? And how do you do that if every year they are getting better and better? And a lot of companies face this and say, you know, this is a real issue. And I'm sure you guys, even if you start as an entrepreneurial student and you, you develop an app, how, how am I going to get my app on the first page on Google? You know, that's, that's what everybody wants. How am I going to get there in the top 10? Because if you're not in the top 10, you're nowhere. So it's almost like I almost won the lottery. Well, you didn't. And that's the same thing with apps. If you're not up there, nobody knows how to find you. So for many companies, meeting these expectations, there, however, is a distant second. And I don't know if you guys have ever worked in a supermarket or in a division, but a great example of this might be Blockbuster. You know, their, their sales went down and they said, we got to sell more videos. People got to rent more videos. So what did they start doing? You guys might not even know this, but there was a place where you could rent a video. You'd go there and actually pick up a video. Uh, I know it's insane, but it, we did this, we did this, and, and happily so. And then we'd walk in the store, but the same store sales were the same every year. So how are we going to get our sales up? So somebody came up with the brilliant idea that you have to walk through this checkout aisle and you could pick up candy and popcorn and Coca-Cola. And the other video stores picked that up and said, oh, great, we got to do that too. Sales are increasing. But what do we really want from a video? We want to see it now. So somebody else in this, in this basement on the West Coast was trying to figure this out, what we really wanted, and it was Netflix. And Netflix came about and boom, they died. And a lot of companies, you'll see this over and over and over again. Kodak, I'll go into a couple examples in, in, uh, in the follow-up slides. A lot of companies do this, which is completely rational. In our company, we were a catalog company and what the, the marketing department told me is like, we don't, you know, they've been cutting back on the catalogs. We need to produce better catalogs and we need to increase the circulation. They've decreased circulation. We need to throw out more catalogs. Whom of you re pick up catalogs? Who's, who's still reading the catalogs? Nobody, right? Well, you, you, okay, good. What is it, guitars or? <laughs> uh, radio equipment. Radio, so, okay, very specialized, right? Radio Shack, by the way, also a store that could have saved itself if it wasn't focused on the myopic stuff, because if you want to be a small telco company and sell uh, cell phones, not a good idea as Radio Shack. They should have really specialized in what they were good at and they might have survived. Um, currently trying to still survive, they're still in the, that chapter 11. Um, 
Uh, how many companies say we love our customers and don't pick, even pick up the phone? And I think all of you have an example. You ever been to Verizon with your cell phone? <laughs> right? And, um, so, so how do we do this? I, you know, if you start a company, you want to start a company, a larger company, how do they do this? Reinvigorate themselves and say, how can we truly add value? But what do we want if we go on a, in a, in a, in an airplane? Let's do airplanes. If I go on to buy an airplane seat, what do we all want? Come on, what do we want? A huge seat, preferably a bed, right? And nobody sitting next to us, free drinks, VIP lounge. But then comes, well, what do we want to pay for it? 100 bucks, that sounds, that's a lot, right? So the real question is, how do we get paid for this? So you can truly add value, but how do you get paid for this? And it's always the second question, never the first. So delivering that value sometimes disrupts an industry. And what we've looked at is what kind of companies do best? Because it might surprise you, but Apple was not the first one with portable music. That was Sony. And there's a lot of industries where you see this. Salesforce was not the first company that figured out. And by the way, they're not in the cloud. You rent their software. I'd buy their software as a company. And you buy it for two years. It's not that I have 100 people now. Next month, I got 105. And this is software as a service. You, buy, you basically have a two-year subscription model. Um, but mo usually, it's not the first ones, the first movers who capitalize on their idea. Uh, Napster, ever heard of it? Right, that was the original, and now we, we don't know. That Zillow was the, the realtor company that went online. So there's a lot of those companies that are first movers, and you should not try to be one of them because you usually get crossed. The success ratio is very, very low. Um, so best is bringing an old industry into the future. Um, Apple, okay, we all had computers before. They didn't look cool. They didn't really act well. And by the way, I say to this point, I just, I got an... Uh, Surface Pro 3 for free a couple of weeks ago from one of our vendors. I, got, uh, I guess they had to get rid of the old inventory, so we all got one. Very clunky. Very clunky. If you get an iPad, it all integrates seamlessly, and I'm sure all of you guys like to... If Apple, by the way, figures out the, the corporate environment, there's going to be a real issue for Microsoft, HP, and the other guys who are really focused on the corporate environment, because it is seamlessly... And I think they might be, might be on the verge of doing something there. Amazon, the same thing. And Sears, you walk in Sears, Kmart, uh, everybody was trying to figure out with better designers, if you walk in, we have smells that will entice you to buy. And then we have special magazines, and we have this, and we have that. And Amazon just figured out, I just got to build a site where ultra cheap I can get it to you the next day. So they really disrupted that. Uber, a uh, great example too is Airbnb. The hotels are looking at this, this myopic behavior. You know what we should do? We should install a fridge in every room. I hate those things. You wake, wake you up in the middle of the night, <laughs> nothing in it, it's useless. But they're in every room because somebody, some marketing person interviewed people and said, oh, I'd like a cold drink. Oh, and that was the solution. And we have better drinks and we have this and we have that. And then Airbnb just figured out what we really wanted was cheap and close to the venue where we need to be. Um, Netflix, I just talked about it. Tesla too, I, I just surprised me to this day. I don't think that Tesla, my son and his friends all think it's the greatest thing in the world. I don't think the design is particularly exciting, the outward design. Now, if you're in the car, it's, it's a super cool car. But outside, it looks like, you know, Honda, any Japanese car, it doesn't look particularly exciting. Why were they the first? Why, Ford General Motors, why? Because they were busy restructuring. They were busy laying off people. So in our industry, we distribute software. So if you guys, for instance, download a copy of WinZip, or if you download a copy of any kind of virtualization software uh, from CDW or any of the main uh, corporate DMRs, they, they, they deliver that to you instantaneously. But that master copy resides on our servers. And we tried to figure out a way, instead of making the fax machine better, and instead of getting the order process to work better, I got together with my IT guy and said, what do people really want? They want that software instantaneously. And wouldn't it be cool if you can download really heavy data packages software? And when you're a developer in a company, because those are the guys that we sell to, wouldn't that be cool if you just press a button and that software downloads automatically? So that's what we really focused on. Whereas our main competition, the hardware distributors, 
um, they were really focused on restructuring their business because FedEx and UPS are moving in. They can ship anything, so they also moved into the IT industry. So that gave us a chance to really develop that stuff, what people really want. But you will be surprised if you start working how few people actually ask their customers. They have teams and they have internal meetings and they, I always tell people in my office to open up the blinds, the enemy and the opportunities are outside, not inside. But you'll be surprised if you worked after a couple of years, you'll be surprised how many enemies and homeopic behavior of, of companies. It's completely logical for their point of view and it's something that we have to fight as leaders. Um, so nobody wants to fail, okay? And actually in the Philippines, I was just there with my wife uh, their word of taking a picture is Kodaking. And a toothbrush is Colgate. I'm not kidding you. It's, I was surprised. Uh, so they have, you know, let's have a Kodaking. We're going to make a picture. You guys probably don't even know anymore Kodak. Instagram was an instant picture. You could make a picture and then it would print instantly. It's fantastic. It's an Android phone or an Apple phone right now, right? So BlackBerry, same thing. You know what the BlackBerry CEO said in 2007 when Apple phone came on? He said, quite honestly, it's a crowded market and it's just another device. And to be honest with you, they haven't really figured out. And to swipe over a piece of glass, is kind of awkward. <laughs> you know how that turned out. So uh, Radio Shack, the same thing. So um, you start out and you say, okay, is, is that part of your strategy? And I just want to put it up here because we want to fail less. But what I learned throughout you know, my 20 years in, 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 in the industry is you have to fail a lot. And, and it, it's not the failing that you do, it's what you learn from it. So um, liquidating the access, 40%, failing to see the projected return, 70 to 80%, failure to meet the projections, 90 to 95%. So most companies fail. And, and a lot of people go into companies with everything they have. You know the problem is we don't commit. You know, you're young, you, we have to fully commit. I'm going to throw my student loan, I'm going to do it all. This is going to work, and then it doesn't. You got to give yourself room to fail. Um, so the projections of now, you know, a lot of young entrepreneurs come to me and do a lot of tech meetup talks. Uh, one was here at the Stevens Institute too. And they come up to me after it's, it's a couple of these talks, and inevitably they show me the projections for the future years. And they're always like this. <laughs> but, uh, and if you ask a young person, how is your life going to be? Boom. One, that's where I'm going to go. Right there. That's not, that's not reality, right? Most of our lives, actually, if you ask people, it's going to be like this. Right? We're super excited, then something happens, and oh my God, boom, I'm down in the basement. I can't believe it. I'm so sad. And a week later, oh, life is not so bad. Something new happens. That is life. That is life. And it's, it's hard to, it's, sometimes it's really hard to, to get up from the bottom. Um, on success, how do you define success? It amazes me. And by the way, I can speak from experience. I kind of started working, and we'll go into that, but I didn't really have a lined out success. You know, people say, start with the end in mind. When you're, and, and, and I read this book, Stephen Covey, you know, the seven steps of effectively. But one thing that stuck with me was start with the end in mind. You attend your own funeral. Who's there? You know, my wife is a nurse and it was a very, very high net worth individual. And they were in the hospital and the only person who was there when he died was the secretary and she was kind of running late. The family wasn't there. And then there are people who you might say, you know, don't have anything. And they're surrounded by family and friends. And you attend your own funeral, what do you want to say? And I just got here, I didn't know anyone. Nobody, by the way, welcomes you if you go to a new country and like, hey friend, you sit there at night and go, I don't know anybody. And it's a tough period of adjustment. And you try to go out and I thought, you know, if I die, I want people to come to my funeral and say, he was a crazy guy, but he tried and he was passionate. And, and you have to start with the end in mind, but a lot of people don't. And so if you don't define success, how are you going to be successful? What kind of goals are you chasing then? So how do you, set, how do you even set goals? What are your goals? Now, uh, change over time. So the problem is, and, and, I, uh, and I mean this seriously, is that here in the U.S. and in the Western world is that we think this is success. Right? It's money. 
I, I work with uh, students from inner cities to try to get them on the first step of the ladder. And I ask them, what do you want to be? I want to be a basketballer, I want to be a singer, I want to be just famous or CEO. How are you going to get there? Are you sure you're going to be that? Absolutely. And I asked him the second question. How are you going to get the money to rent your car to go to your first job to get to the CEO level? That they don't have any idea about. But they know they want to be CEO and they're going to be a CEO or a basketballer or, or whatever. So these ladies, I mean, I don't know any marriage. I think none of them is successful. The, the, the joke was, right, one, one turned into an alcoholic, one into a lady. I wonder what they're going to do with Kanye West, right? <laughs> Nobody knows how these husbands end up, and nobody knows how these ladies end up. But you ask people and say, what do you want to be? If I would give you $5 million, I mean, Jersey Shore was on, right? And I tell people proudly I'm from the Jersey Shore. I've been here since 98, I feel at home. I tell them all the time I'm from Jersey Shore, and people made fun of you, MTV. Or it's a beautiful area, and we've got a lot more to offer than just that. But you ask them, like, I'll give you $9 million, and you can get drunk every single night. And people go, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and that's a shame. So I think we have to change that pattern. I was in China talking to, uh, to friends of mine. I went in, in, in 05 to, uh, to Harvard. And uh, uh, we had a reunion in, in China. And our Chinese friends were hosting it. And I said, what's, what's the issue according to you? He said, the issue is that you guys see Britney Spears as Britney Spears. For us, Bill Gates is Britney Spears. They really view different people. And I challenge you guys to turn on TV here to see not garbage. I, by the way, I really don't watch TV. My wife is here and my daughter. They know I really do not watch TV. I think it's all garbage. Um, why, why do we know who was the highest, the most creative student that graduated this year in New Jersey? Do you think we could put a nice TV show about that? Or the most philanthropic person in New Jersey? The fastest runner? The, the, the most exciting, the latest technology, what's the, what's the best medication that we developed this year in, in New Jersey? We don't have that. We don't focus on it. So how about these people? You could define success as that, right? Stephen Hawking, Mandela, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Bill Gates, who I really admire, doing a lot of great stuff. So in my personal situation, make it personal success. For me, this means success. This is our family. Um, my wife and my son, who's 18 and he studies in Amsterdam right now, we went back, he's, I feel bad for him, 18 in Amsterdam. Uh, <laughs> and yes, drinking is, and a whole lot of other stuff is all legal in Amsterdam. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're all here, we're all well dressed, you know, we're clean. But seriously, you build a good foundation, because a lot of people don't build a good foundation. And it's like the, the three little pigs in their homes. A little wind blows and it falls over. And you need a good foundation, trust me. If you want to be successful in life, you need a good foundation. As a CEO of my company, I have many people coming to me and asking me for car loans. I'm, I, I, uh, I'm getting a divorce, can you help me? Uh, and a lot of those stuff is self-inflicted wounds. By meaning, you know, some people just like drama and if they don't have drama in their lives, they're gonna create some. And I really think if you cut that short and you really try to focus on building a solid foundation, life is going to be a lot easier for you. So success could be like this, could be defined as, you know, I'm spending time with my family. I have the freedom to really choose if I want to go to the office now or if I want to spend time with my family. And I'm there a lot for them because I can. I can work at night. But I also give that freedom to our employees who really like that and stay with our company and hence to more productive and hence to make more money for us. So it's really simple logic that a lot of people I think miss. So what's the opposite of success? Failure to achieve and failure how you got there. Like the Super Bowl, apparently the ball was deflated, so they were successful, but there was some failure in how they got there, right? Um, so there's two things that you can learn from and you have to ask yourself when you start a new venture or when you fail, did I fail even though I got there or did I fail in in, in just getting there. Was my process okay, but it had just failed to get the desired result. All right? Um, it's better than regret. A lot of people forget that. A lot better than regret. Uh, builds your character. It really does. And the reason we are human beings, not gods, the gods said we created people in between good and bad just so they could have a fantastic drama play for us, the gods, to watch. And they were right. <laughs> 
because we will give them a good show and we continue to do so. And it also makes success that much better. We were just talking about, you know, the, the level of candidates in the campaign. I'm sure everybody has an opinion about that. I could just vote. I just became an American citizen this year and I didn't pay too much attention to it prior to it. And I continue not to pay too much attention to it because um, I got stuff to do. But I, would, I told him, I said, the, the good thing about all these bad politicians is it will be so much better for the wave that comes after them, right? We will look, we, we as the next generation, will look that much better. So it makes success that much better. So uh, it's a, a, a thing that I think is vitally important in business and not a lot of people know it, and I got acquainted with, um, with this a little later in life, is, I don't know if you guys know this guy, but it's Joseph Campbell. And somebody gave me a copy of this book, The Power of Myth. And that really changed my life. It really, really did. And it might not seem to have to do anything with business, but I can highly recommend you guys read it. Highly recommend it, read it. And he's talking about the mono myth. So you start there, the call to adventure. And the problem is that's a circle of life. And I'll do this, explain it really quick, see if I have time. Yeah, um, so Hans and Gretel, anybody knows the story about Hans and Gretel? Everybody? Good. All right, so they leave. It's actually us leaving where we came from before. All right, leaving mom and dad. And then we go out on our own. We're teenagers, and we have to go back. We find our way back. But as Hans and Gretel, we find out the problem stays the same. Mom and dad are still annoying, and I still have to live with them. So you leave them in the end. And what happens? And this was me, and it's going to be you, and it happens to every single person in the world. You get lost in the woods. And then what happens? You see the shining house. That is consumerism. That is uh, addictions. So you see this house and you start eating and you become successful. And I bought my first car and I bought a house and I bought a larger house and I bought a boat and I bought this and I bought that. So what you do is you start accumulating that stuff. But it's like the witch, it almost will burn you if you don't understand that that's not the end goal. So this is the, the challenges and temptations here. And then the abyss, death and rebirth. And then you finally understand, and Bill Gates, like for instance, was completely focused on making money. And then he was talking about this problem of death and abyss. You realize it. And Hans and Gretel, what happened? They pushed her in her own fire. You burn that desire. You're not drinking anymore. I'm not going to drink this week. Well, forget it. I can tell you I'm a little older now. We get together as CEOs. One of the biggest problems that they have is stay away from drinking, eating, smoking, because you need to release tension, and we don't know how to do that. You might also run, by the way, or you might take a walk, or you might get a dog, but that's some, we don't realize it in the beginning yet. That's what we want to do. Um, or go into politics, or go fishing. <laughs> um, so you, but, but anyway, they push you in the fire, right? And then she burns, and then what happens? The house burns down, and what do they find underneath the house? Jewels. That's what you find if you burn that. You find real treasure. And then you go, they have to go across the water, and the white birds helps them, and which, by the way, in, in the stories, and Bettelheim is Bruno Bettelheim. The real uh, stories about uh, fairy tales is fantastic. Snow White, for instance, you, uh, or the, the, the Sleeping Beauty, is a girl who's 12 and she gets her first period. That's what it means to prick herself on the wheel. And she, her parents don't allow her to grow up as a person and she falls mentally asleep. And who saves her? The knight on the white horse, the guys who mom and dad approve. And what happens? They marry and they're happily ever after. I had no idea that that was the story behind this. Um, interesting meaning of Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, there's so, a lot of, so Bethlehem, really great guy. Hans and Gretel come home with the jewels and they go back. And at the end of our life, we go back and we, we get rid of all the material stuff and we start giving back and we come back to the place from where we came from. And that circle could be large or could be small. And I know a lot of people in the town that I grew up with that that is a very small circle. And that this outside life doesn't exist. My town is the best and I'm just going to work here. Why would you even study? I'm going to live in my little circle. And it's fear that keeps them there. And that circle will be very small for you, or it could be large, your choice. So I can highly recommend this book, The Power of Myth, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Do you know that every single religion in the world that are, by the way, completely not related to each other, every single one of them has a story about a, a water 
uh, sad moment where the whole world floods and there's a person who survives, the Ark of Noah, and every single soul. To me, it's amazing. The monomyth, it's our collective dream. So the hero with a thousand face, I can highly recommend. He's long since died. He did a great interview with Bill Moyers. It's six hours of tape, or you buy this book and just read it on the plane. It's great stuff. Uh, be honest with yourself, at least with yourself. Um, I have friends who are doctors, very successful doctors, because mom and dad want them to be a doctor. They're not happy. They actually want to be writers. Or they want to be something else. But guess what? You know, I had to do that. I had to support my family. But you never know what lies on the other side. And I kind of fell into this a little bit. Really ponder this question regularly. Why are you alive? What gold are you going to bring back? Hans and Gretel found those jewels. What jewels are you going to find and bring back to the world? Because it would be very, very sad for your life to live nothing else and get $5 million a year and get drunk every night. Because you can bring nothing back. And I'm not saying, by the way, that it's not important because getting drunk is fun. It's in moderation. Okay? Um, and that's what Plato said. Moderation is the greatest good. I never got that. I thought it was all BS. I was 25. And I was amazed what I learned after I knew everything. Like the old folks always blah, blah, blah. I just want to go full on. And I did. And now I understand the saying like, okay, moderation is the greatest good. It's hard for me still to let go of my company, to let go of procedures, to not be involved in everything is very, very hard. Um, all right, so really ponder that question regularly. It's okay not to notice at the start of your life. Completely okay. It's not okay to not notice at the end of your life. So just remember that. Um, wherever you go, you bring yourself. A lot of people say, you know what? This town doesn't work for me anymore. This state doesn't work for me anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. But wherever you go, you bring yourself. And I know guys who are on their third wife, and no, didn't bring them much happiness. And at the end, talking about that circle, guess who they want to be with? I should have stayed with my wife, man. The kids don't like me anymore. I made a mistake, but it's too late. That circle has closed. There's somebody else now, and you're outside of the circle. So um, it's me when I was, I don't know, 10, I guess. My family, my youngest sister wasn't even born yet. We were born in the south of the Netherlands in a very poor town. And it was like saying I'm from Camden. You know, people here are like, okay, what was it like? That was like, I'm from Camden. Like, you have no... no no chance of success, forget it. It's not going to work. So I wanted to get out of that town, and I wanted to study. My dad was a CPA, so I thought, okay, they go to, a, to an office, they wear ties, and it looks pretty nice. At least it's clean. I don't have to go to the factory. I was working in a bakery in a factory when I was 12 in a supermarket. Didn't like that too much. So I thought if I study hard, I become an accountant. I have an office and a lease car from the office would be great. So I went to Amsterdam, I, I, I got there, I was the youngest manager, I worked really hard, fantastic, great, uh, made money and I thought I did it, but I really didn't like being an auditor. I really did not like it. I didn't like it, so I didn't know what to do. I really didn't like it. And I wasn't honest with myself, I thought, you know, at least I make good money, but I didn't like it. So then I stumbled upon this company, and they were buying a company, I went into merger acquisitions, and they, I stumbled upon them, I followed them, and I joined them. This was the trajectory. I, I say, okay, they, they say, you can join, but you have to go to Paris. And I said, well, that's, that's no problem. My wife luckily said yes as well. We just had our first son. Uh, he was a year old. Not a, lot of, not a lot of women said yes. Not a lot of guys said yes. But I said, yes, let's try it. We're young, why not? Say yes. So I did. It looked like a great company. This is what happened. So I joined there. I moved, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it didn't go so well. So in that next year, I did good. I became the European controller. I worked myself up in this company. I became the European controller, and I said, if we do this on a worldwide basis, it'll be better, that better. So why don't you come to us? Move, come, uh, I go to, uh, to New Jersey. I came to New Jersey. Then in one year, it became very clear why 2K happened. This company was about to go bankrupt. And I said, if you sent me back to Europe and let me become CEO of Europe, I can restructure those companies. By the way, there were six previous companies that they bought. We were doing 400 million, 300 million of which in Europe. All previous entrepreneurs were still there, all in their 50s, sold out, so had no financial interest anymore, other than to throw mud at each other. And these management meetings were horrible. Nobody was in charge. So I said, I have a plan. If you sent me back, I can, I can sell it. I was, uh, 
29 at the time or 30, yeah, 29 or 30. So they said, forget it, we're not going to do that. But they ran out of options and they sent me back. I restructured it, sold it to an East German company, and I came back here to the U.S. I had options to go back to Ernst & Young, but this company wanted me back here, and we really liked living in New Jersey, so we said, let's go back. Might surprise you, but we really liked it here. Um, so we came back, and then I restructured the company. I wrote a restructuring plan. At that time, they had a CFO here who wrote a plan. I wrote a plan. I'm here, so I guess they chose my plan. Um, <laughs> So they, um, but I was always honest with the board. And one thing I can highly recommend, whenever you start, speak your truth. And at the end, I have a one page uh, literature. It's called Desiderata. I don't know if you guys know it, but I live by that. I really try to live by that. Speak your truth. Speak it calmly and with diplomacy, but speak your truth. And if you speak up, a lot of people will think you have a lot of power because who's speaking up to the board? I can't believe he did that. The CEO came in and the CFO said, we have to make this quarter. And we, we shuffled it around a little bit and we invested a lot in a new product, which by the way was going to be, uh, Alibaba was going to be. So we would combine all the purchasing prices in a single portal to you. And then if you buy a pencil, you could see who was the cheapest and buy via portal and then we get a cut of that. And we spent over $2 million in developing that and it didn't really work. So I walk into the CEO's office and he says, how much did we spend on developing that? So I said, I actually have no idea. I could look into it, but I have no idea. So we walk out and the CFO, we walk out and he says to me, don't you dare say that ever again. You'll make up a number and then we'll figure it out afterwards because we look like fools. So I say, excuse me? So I walk back in the CEO's office. I said, I was just told that I have to make up a number and then come up with the, re uh, with the recommendations afterwards. Is that what you want? Because I, I, I don't want to work like that. And the CEO said, of course not. And the other people who were with me were just flabbergasted. Don't do that, but you do. You have to do that because if you don't cut it off, you suddenly you become part of that other side, which you don't want to be. And when you're young, it's easy to say no. When you're old and when you're invested, when you have money in the company, it's hard to say no. Um, and people do dumb stuff when it comes to greed. So our company went down 80%. We were almost bankrupt. The market went up 11%. This is what happened afterwards. I took over. We were doing 60 million. And this is what happened afterwards. We're going to do close to $400 million this year. Um, I restructured everything. I told people at, at conferences, and they did not like me at conferences. I told them, fire all your consultants. If you're the CEO, if you're in charge, you should lead. You should know what to do. And otherwise, you should make all your consultants CEOs. And a lot of people have consultants. You know why? Because they have somebody to blame. If it goes wrong, it wasn't me. I uh, outsourced this, and I didn't have time for that, and the consultants are wrong. That's absolute BS. Your leader, you take the blame. And if something goes wrong with my company, I always take the blame to the board. I never, ever, I never did this. When I was leading three people, something went wrong in my department, accounts receivable, the money didn't come in, I would stand up and say, it's my mistake, I will fix it. I never, ever once said, Joey here, he didn't do a good job, and I hate people who do that. And I'm sure if you ever had a job, you know that. Middle managers, can use it. they say, poop rolls down the hill, but in the middle, there's a little cliff, and that's middle management, and it sticks there. <laughs> and that's very true, by the way. So, uh, 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 income from operations, we exploded. We started, really started making good money again. I paid off the, all the bank loans. I don't have any bank loans. We're one of the most conservatively financed public companies. 78% um, uh, of our equity is cash. I'm very conservative. Call it Dutch, but I'm very conservative. I run it as a, public, as, a, as a public company, but if you dial into our quarterly calls, I run it as a private company. We want to be here for the long term. So real life, what happened? Our stock went up 500% compared to 30% for the overall Fortune 500. Very successful. Um, uh, went to events. By the way, Under Armour, we were number seven fastest growing, and on, Under Armour was number eight. I wish I would have bought all the stock that I could in Under Armour. <laughs> My God, did they take off. Kevin Plank, I met him, really great guy. Um, also Zeppo's guy, Tony Shea. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. That is a great business book about Tony Shea. Uh, if you ever want to read a business book, read, up, read that business book. Great book, how he built Zappos and build it. Uh, great, great guy. Um, so we went down in 06, 08. I remember 08, bad year. Uh, so we went down, market went down, we went up. Okay, so now comes the interesting part. What did I learn? All right, I love this app answer. <laughs> I just had to put that one in. I love that one. 
and, and the, you know, One Minute Manager, all these books. And do you learn how to drive by reading a manual? No, you drive. So you, the, all these shortcuts, I, I spent days and nights working. There are no shortcuts in life. There are none. But we all want them desperately. You know, just take this pill instead of taking a healthy walk around the block. And then I also wouldn't have to take the sleepy pills. You would be tired if you work out during the day. But we don't know how to get rich quick. I mean, there are books you go to an airport. They sell like crazy. I don't want to work. I just want to get it quick. Lottery. By the way, do lottery. They do lottery research. All the people who win the lottery, they're all poor five years later. If you don't know how to handle money, money will not flow towards you. And if it does flow to you, it will just go through you like water. So, still like the app answer, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. All right, so everyone gets advice, only the wise to listen. Um, I started working, I had a suit, and I had white socks. I didn't know that I wasn't done. Manager said, like, you might not want to wear that. I travel regularly. There's 70 year olds who are still wearing white socks. I had this lady in the office, and I said, you know, it would help if you would be more diplomatic in your interactions with, with, with customers and with people here. And she goes, well, I, I'm Italian. That's just the way we are. You know, that's, I'm just Italian. And, and she starts, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, can you imagine? I told her, I said, and, and I laughed with her, and she was great. And I'm, that's just the way I am. I said, can you imagine, by the way, if you were adopted and you're really Norwegian, <laughs> right? You, you tell yourself that, and then it's an excuse. And a lot of people do that. As soon as people give them feedback, they go, but, 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 I know why I did that, and start rationalizing it. Don't do it. Just take it at face value. And the people who give you feedback are the best people in the world. Trust me. Just take it. Change. Okay? Um, passionate. Say yes, guys. Say yes. I went to work for Ernst Young. I was from the small town. I called and I called and I called and I called and they got me in. And I was there on time. And they asked me, what books did you read? And I said, Alvin Toffler, The Future Wave, The Third Wave. I thought it was fantastic. I read books. I was ready for it. And I just interviewed this guy three weeks ago at their office, a young kid, just graduated college. And I get emails all the time from kids who want to work from us and, and people who want to work from us. Did you know what an interesting career I've had? I've, I've been a multi-million dollar manager and now you have the chance to hire me. I don't care. I really don't care. They think they're entitled. This young man introduced him to our company, read our 10K. And if you do that when you go to an internship, he did. He read the 10K. He said, I'm really not sure I understand your business, but I read the 10K and he mentioned some interesting points. He knew our business. He went to our website. He did all of that stuff. He impressed me. That's what I did. I believe in it. Say yes. And you see that fire in somebody else's eye? That's a person I want to be a mentor of and guide them through life because they have fire in their eyes. And I said, yes, a Budapest up there. The reason I said Budapest, I was in Amsterdam and I made it, according to a lot of people, just ran to the place for six months and I was staying. Actually, I couldn't find the place, so I stayed with uh, my, my now wife's grandmother and I traveled to the office like 45 minutes by train. I did all that stuff and I was there on time. That's also important. I tell the kids to be on time. And I, there was an opening in Budapest. Nobody wants to go. I'm in Amsterdam. Why would I go to Budapest? Yes, in an instant, absolutely I'll go. What can I do? So I went to Budapest, and the reason all these other pictures, yes to moving. Yes, go to a different country. It will open up your eyes. I came here. By the way, what does OZ stand for? Why is, L, what is, why is LB and it stands for pound? I come here, I'm like, that's one LB. Oh, that's pound. Then why is it LB? <laughs> Just, dollar, do you know where dollar comes from? Dalder is a Dutch word. The Bronx is Aaron Bronk, was a farmer and people used to get groceries from uh, the Bronx family. And the English couldn't cut it out, so it was Bronx. All this stuff I knew because I went to a different country and I thought, why is this stuff like this? And it just changes your brain. So I highly recommend go to a different country, say yes to moving. I started running, you know, I, I, was, I told you, like you start drinking, you start doing this, you try to get a, a, a relief from tension. I started running and then I started running a lot. Again, moderation wasn't my greatest good, so I started doing, 
uh, a uh, marathon in a week, then I did two, then I did three, then I did ultra marathons, we did a 100k run. It helped for a while, but then that got an obsession. But I said yes to it, explore it, see what's there. Now I'm in this phase. I'm going to Buddhism service, and actually, yes, that is my oil painting. I, I paint on Monday, which my friends think is hilarious. Um, but I do, I paint, and it helps me quiet down, and uh, Buddhism helps. And this, the aircraft carrier, was another thing. I'm not a big fan of war, but I wanted to land on an aircraft carrier in my life while I was in the ocean. So I called the, uh, the, uh, the Navy over and over and over again. And one month I called them, the other month I emailed them, and I reached out to them and said, I can get six high-end CEOs to come to your ship and we can spread the word about what the army is doing if you get me on a ship. Which I thought sounded completely logical. They didn't. Um, but after two years, they said yes. And it was in front of uh, Florida and we landed on it. And I could tell you, it was fantastic. <laughs> Landing on it, that hook gets you. It's amazing. We spent 24 hours on this boat and we could go anywhere. We saw the nuclear reactor. We saw the prison. We wanted to see the prison. Very small. No one's there, by the way. Um, <laughs> and we saw the back of the ship. We're in that control room. Do you know that we're the only country in the world? France has also these aircraft carriers. But we are the only country in the world that can land at night. And if you see these guys landing at night, it is absolutely amazing. I'm standing on this bridge while they're landing at night. And these young guys, they just do it over and over again. And the level of, of just dedication and passion to me was amazing. And none of us went to bed the 24 hours. We were there up, we were just with, and they have big boss and little boss in that control room. And after two miles, it becomes big boss and little boss. And the jacket says big boss and little boss. It's really cool and a great environment to learn what it is to be with passionate people, okay? So we also heard about the downside on the Navy. There's an enormous amount of people who commit suicide because it's a really confined environment. 6,000 people on a ship like that. So it asks a lot from you. It's a high pressure cooker. But I thought it was on my bucket list. I'm going to try doing it. And everybody said, there's no way. You're a foreigner. There's no way they're going to let you land on an aircraft carrier. I did it. And they shoot you off, by the way. They say, don't worry. It feels like you're fa falling into the ocean. But gravity will pick you up that wasn't the best moment <laughs> they will shoot you off and it feels like you're really crashing and then you take off so anyway do that it doesn't have to be this I'm just sharing my stuff it's not about me it's but do something interesting do it live your dreams live it um, do what needs to be done challenge everything you come inside a company, it doesn't make sense. Why do people, by the way, go to a supermarket and my daughter works at the cash register? Why do we still have to go to the cash register? Have you been to South Korea? They just go and just scan as soon as you put it in the bucket and you can walk out. And in my company, I'm like, why do we have catalogs? Why do we even have desks? Why do people come in all day? And middle management like, I've got to make sure that they're working. If the, you know, how could I know if they're working? It's all on a computer. I cut printing. There's no printing in our company. A very select few departments have printing, and people said, I need to print. I said, well, you can choose a notepad or, or a computer, one of the two, your choice. Many chose a computer. Why? Because if it's not on a computer, it doesn't count. But why do people work from eight to five? Do you think work really comes in five equal blocks of eight hours from eight to five in the afternoon? No. So I said, work from home. So in the summer, we, my company, we send people home three days a week. You can do whatever you want. If you want to work at night, put the kids to bed first, cook for them, have a family dinner, fine with me, work at night. Workers love this. Management doesn't like it. Because they, uh, they want to measure, and I call it, because you guys have a lot of TLAs in the US, three letter abbreviations, I call it AOC time, it's ass on chair time. Because if somebody sits in their chair and they walk by, like, he's working. And if they're late, what are we going to do? We'll make them stay half an hour later. What are we, in school? Are we 16 years old or we have to stay all late? That doesn't make sense to me at all. People have to be productive. How do you measure productivity? Let's focus on that and challenge everything. So challenge everything. And this is something I learned the hard way, too. By the way, gossiping. Don't care about people gossip. Um, a certain percentage of you think I'm terrible. I'll never go to a speech like that again. And a certain percentage of you will like me. I am trying to do good. And most people in the world try to do good. That is not how it's seen, by the way. We can all go to the same party. I looked through a glass and I said, man, there's only beautiful women here. 
if I would have just broken up with my, my, my lady, I will say, I see a lot of sad people there. And other people will say, oh, there's a lot of people laughing. Oh, it's a great party, it's a bad party. Ever watch the movie and you're not in the mood for a comedy and you watch that comedy? <sighs> That's a terrible comedy. I'm gonna get aggravated at this stuff. It's, it's you have to be in the mood. So your glasses, your observation have to be, has to be there. So this is, if I let somebody go in front of traffic, that person who I let go in front of traffic will think I'm an awesome person, right? Let, you don't have to right away, but I let them go. Thank you. What does the person behind you think? Oh my God. <laughs> it's not you, it's just the fact that you're there. In traffic, I mean, right? It ju they're just there. I hate them because they're there. They're not good or bad. They just, just go away. The road should be empty. So um, that's a lesson too in life. You do what you think is right and people will crucify you for it. And, and there's a lot of people try to be fake. Don't be fake. Don't live somebody else's life. Live your own life. Because also if you're fake, people are going to hate you for being fake. So it never works out that way. So it all gets complicated. Just be yourself. And the easy button is after the fact, after we make a lot of changes, a lot of people will jump on, on your side and go, absolutely, I totally agree. With hindsight, everybody's right. Okay? Um, it is not. So think of simple solutions first, real quick. Uh, I'll tell the story of the bell. We had a problem with people picking up the phone. People don't pick up the phone. We install very expensive software to measure how many dropped calls we have. Manager says, I said, I get it at the end of the week. What am I going to do with this? Well, you can yell at people for not picking up the phone because you can see how many calls they dropped that week. Okay, I, but it doesn't happen in real life. Well, now we have an upgrade of the software and it tells you the next day how many calls dropped. So you can tell them the day after, isn't that great? And I go, no, because it's still like they'll lose the calls. So I went together with my IT guy, and it's Vito Legretelli, awesome guy. Uh, yes, he's from uh, Patterson. And yes, he lived in a town where uh, the Sopranos, uh, one of the actors, also grew up. Uh, but awesome guy, and together we sat and discussed this problem. And I thought back about my family, I come from a big family. If, my, if we wouldn't, the phone would ring in our, in our house, what would happen? It's a loud bell, and my mom would yell, pick up the phone. I'm like, that's it, there's no loud bell. So what we did in the, in the company, we hang up these huge two bells, and if you don't pick up the phone within 15 seconds, huge bell starts ringing in the office. Everybody hears it. Problem solved. <laughs> 200 bucks, done, could throw out the software. People in my, uh, my company pick up the phone. And the other thing is too, when you call, which I don't understand, right? The bank calls you at night, right? Hey, we have an offer. Do you really think I want to talk at 7.30 at night about some offer of the bank of a mortgage rate? Do not call me, ever. When I call you, I don't want to know that it's one for English, two for Spanish, three for accounting, four for mortgage, five for this, five if you're a customer, six if you're a sapphire. It drives me crazy. In our company, dial one for sales. You dial one for sales, boom, somebody picks up. When you call us, nobody calls me to just joke around. None of you will call the bank, will call Verizon, will call anybody to, you know, to waste time. You want to be helped. So you got to talk to a live person right away. That was my credo, helped a lot in our company. The other one about the, um, about the door, real quick. The problem, warehouse workers came to work late, CEO didn't know what to do. Warehouse manager said, and this really truly happened in North Jersey, warehouse manager said, I got it, if you give me 300 bucks, I have the solution for this. He tried management issues, all this stuff. You know what he did? The warehouse manager came into the CEO's office, corner office, I don't know why, but I also have a corner office in the US that seems to be the thing that if you're the CEO, you're in a corner somewhere. Um, maybe because they don't want you to be away. I want to be in the middle, but they want you to be away on the side somewhere. But, he said, okay, great, I have 300 bucks, I'll solve it for you. He went to the Home Depot, bought this door, cut a hole in the wall of the CEO's office. All the other doors would close after 8.30. That was the only door through which you could go in and out of work after 8.30. Took about three days, problem solved. Everybody was on time, trust me. You don't want to walk through the CEO's office late. Okay, and he really has this door still in his office. I think it's fantastic. That is simple solutions. All right, be inquisitive. You see that guy, the brain morans, can't even spell. I love these things. Make English America's official, official language. I love it. She's angry about people not being able to speak English. She can't speak English herself. Um, so th this stuff is like be inquisitive, know your stuff.
know your stuff. And I ask, I ask people about this. You know, th this, dude, this really amazes me. Um, how many people live in the U.S.? I ask, I ask people in my, in my, my company. I ask people in my company, 100 to 200 million. Hands go up, 200 to 300 million. Hands go up, 300 to 400 million. Hands go up, four or 500 million. Hands go up, over 500 million. Hands go up. And people tell me all the time, I'm very, we're very patriotic. We love our country, Simon. You gotta understand that. The US is the most important thing in the world. Okay, well, how many citizens do you have in that great country of yours? I don't know that. Now, why are you asking that question? What are you, like some liberal, smart European? <laughs> It's weird to me. People say, are you religious? And my mom is a minister and I know the Bible very well and they tell me the Bible is the most important thing in the world. And I tell them, we read, we do, we read all kinds of literature to my kids. I also read them the Norse religions and all this stuff. But you seem to be really on the Bible. How, what, how many books does the New Testament have? And they look at you like, what are you, what are you gonna question me? Just tell me it's the most important book in your life. How many books does the New Testament? I don't know, I don't know. Of the Ten Commandments, which six do you think is most applicable to your life? They can't name two. And this happens a lot in business too. A lot. We should go into this new product. Why? Johnny from Marketing said so. How many books do we sell? How many of this product do we sell? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. How many people in Canada are our neighbors? Who thinks uh, over 50 million? Over 100 million Canadians. It's 35, 35 million only. So um, really know what you're talking about. And I got an example about this, uh, this as well. Oh, yeah, the same as, by the way, the days of the week too, right? You know, Wednesday, Wodan, upper god in the Norse religion. Freya is his wife, Friday. Not a lot of people know this stuff. Not a lot of people. So be inquisitive, just ask questions. And in business, that's very important. If I see a young person questioning everything, that's super value for us. So that's what I learned. I did this, I questioned everything. And if I didn't know it, by the way, I used to have to go to the library on my bike and then pass the librarian, try to get into the library to get stuff. You guys are so lucky, you got Google. You got a smartphone, you, you got everything. But just ask the right questions. And it amazes me how many people just use that app, just the fart app is funny. Oh my God, we do this super game and I'm like, you know, you can know anything, any question that you want to answer. And we play Candy Crush in the plane. <laughs> and they're, and they're, by the way, and they're so angry if the Wi-Fi doesn't work in the plane. Do you know how amazing that is that the air Wi-Fi works in the plane? Oh my God, oh, I can't play my Candy Crush. <laughs> amazing. Know your stuff. All right. I want to die young, fat, sick, and divorced. Anybody? <laughs> Example, just a quick example, and then we'll go. Anybody? No? So I questioned, like, I want to live long. Where do people live the longest? Apparently in Japan. Why do we live not as long here in Japan than is in Japan? By the way, do you know that women have an 80, 80 times higher rate of breast cancer in the U.S. and in the Western world than they have in Africa, certain African countries? And we all want to prevent breast cancer and we want to prevent cancer rates. There are websites that will show you Incidents of drinking, by the way, you know, Russia is amazing, the level of alcoholism. But why are the rates of breast cancer in, Niger in, in Af certain African countries 80 times less than in the US? And we all want to help prevent that. So there are doctors who do research uh, into that. And it appears that a diet has a lot to do with it. But I wanted to know, I'm living in the US. I want to live long, I want to live happy. So I looked this up, and with my son, we're on Saturday morning. This is the stuff that we do on Saturday morning. Other people sleep in. I'm like, who would die the youngest and the fattest and the sick? So we looked this up, and easy, two minutes, you can find this out. Here's the States. Who thinks it's um, here on the West? Who thinks people die earliest in the West? Anybody? No? North? Anybody? South? What? Southeast? Northeast? All right. Here we go. There's your life expectancy by county. Beautiful. And Google that in 10 seconds, I have my answer. Look at that. That's where you die. Why? Why? <laughs> Early. 
Six years younger than, by the way, in the Northeast. That's a lot. I want to spend time with my grandkids. Six years. I'll take the six years. Tell me what to do now, and I will try to do it. Why? Then you ask yourself, why? So we start looking up certain things that we have made assumptions. All right. Rated obesity by county. Must say a little thing, right? It's right there. Diabetes, right there. Do you know, by the way, just on Monday, we heard this again from a very smart professors here at the school at the Presidential Advisory Committee. 70% of the U.S. adults are obese. By 2050, one-third will have diabetes, type 1 and type 2. That is insane to me. Running is so much fun. Walking is so much fun. Do that. So, uh, cancer mortality, look at that. By the way, the fried Oreos, I went to a rodeo there, are fantastic. <laughs> They're wrapped in bacon now, too. It's just, I thought like bacon, chocolate, and Oreos, that doesn't go together. It goes together perfectly, beautiful. <laughs> it is fantastic. Don't try it. All right? This is what happens. This is what happens. And again, that's also Hans and Gradle. It's instant gratification, eating and drinking, versus long-term gratification. I have some long-term sense. So, Divorce rate, look at that. And that, by the way, is hypocrisy. Because I can show you the Bible Belt, and it's exactly there. Right? Or believe God, and it's got all the TV. I had never seen TV preachers, by the way. Three weeks ago, I saw this on TV, and it really is. G650, apparently. I'm in the airport and seeing it. There's a G650 campaign. This priest wants to buy a Gulfstream 650, and he has a $24 million capital campaign. And you can do seat money, and God will reward you if you give $10,000 to this guy to buy a Gulfstream. Fantastic. Fantastic. Only works there. Only works there, apparently. So divorce rate by country. Fruit. Then we said fruit and vegetable consumptions. Non-existent, non-existent. <laughs> All right, that was just 10 minutes of browsing, and, and we had fun with it, so I thought I would share it with you. Okay, here's something that I really think we, all of us, don't think about. You see the Paris attacks, the terrible attacks we see in business, all the challenges that we face, and people say we have to set ourselves apart and we're oversupply, we're over this and that. Nobody ever talks about this, and it's super important that all of you know this. And I think it should be part of at least education, edu educating people here. We were with 3 billion in 1960. We're at almost 8 million. This was 2004. It is just projected upwards. We are there. Do you look at that graph? The number one problem for global security is this whole Arab uprising is they all had 12 sons. We were just talking about it. They all had 12 sons, but none of these sons were educated. None of them. 80% unemployment. What would I do when I was 20 and my friend would come by and I'm uneducated, he says, with a gun, we're gonna shoot up the next town, man. We're gonna to grab the gold. What do you think? Sounds awesome to me. And that's the sad part of it. They're uneducated and we cannot control this population and the earth cannot take it. And I don't care if you believe in global warming, but overpopulation is the number one cause for global warming. And a lot of people, this is like, you can't say it, but it's absolutely true. Because if you live, you consume CO2 and there's more, the production of CO2 is, by the way, the same graph. Absolutely the same graph. So we have to control population. Um, I want to show you this, uh, this, um, this clip. And you say, like, I don't know what to make. Go to developing countries. We just came back from the Philippines. We go to the Harvard reunion every year, but I try to educate myself. Me and my wife, we went to Manila, and everybody flew directly to the beautiful island of Cebu and went to the five-star resort. We decided to stop in Manila, as we decided to stop in Bangkok, as we decided to stop in Beijing, instead of going directly to Shanghai, and travel through the country. And you land, and you see this, if you're lucky, if it's not covered in smog, because you try to get four kilometers, and you can't even see the end of the road because it's blue with smog as it was in Beijing, the forbidden city. You couldn't, yeah, it was really forbidden because I couldn't see it, smogged up. Uh, from this, it looks kind of okay, right? Look how it looks close up. And this is 50% of that town. This is what we drove through. This was kind of normal. See that lady there with, with the child? I mean, they really live there, and it's not for a year. A hurricane didn't just happen. This is 20 years. They live like this their whole life. And I don't care who you, I mean, expose yourself to this and your life will change. This is a normal street after rain. And the kids, by the way, walk through this. So I just really quick want to show you this. 
one minute video of, um, so we went through, a, it's called a slum tour, and they take you to a garbage belt where people live, and they, uh, it's with an NGO, a local person takes you in so you can walk in there. And this is what we saw. So I think hopefully we can get sound with the, uh, with the video. We walked through this. Get that off. This is a regular Can street. Miles and miles of these streets. Mm -hmm. see, so, yeah, and these fighting cocks, dogs. And kids barefoot walk. Through. By the way, the dump truck dumps this every day, and this is their work. They sort out the plastic. That's their work. And that's a house there where the water is in. That's where people live. The bat is standing there. That's where they sleep. Not one day. That's 30 years. That's 40 years. That's their life. And you see these kids walking through the water there. And the guide said, if you touch that water, you need about 40 injections to get to get clean. It's unbelievable. Two stories high, too. By the way, there's no sewage or water or anything there. And, and these, by the way, are some of the kindest people that we have met. So this, you know, this picture we made from these kids there at the Islam. It's not a bomb didn't go off. This is how they live. And if you want to ask me, I need good business ideas. I don't know what to do. I don't know what, to, what we can do. I know a lot of stuff that you can do. And you can get money from this. If we can build solar boats, they can get rid of this. If we can get better infrastructure, these countries need it and we need it. Because if you pee, I don't care if you believe in global warming or not. Try to suck in the exhaust fume from cars for half an hour. See how you feel. If, you, if we pee in the water long enough, we're all drinking pee, trust me. And so, so what I want to le leave you with is like one thing I learned too, I was cynical. I'm like, oh my God, this is funny, that's funny, it's not. Be kind. Everyone that you meet is fighting a hard battle. So be kind to people, be diplomatic. Like I said before, speak the truth, but say it in a nice way. A lot of people are ruining the future, running from the past again too. It's like, you know, I did wrong here, so I'm just quickly going to do that. And I'm going to solve this bankruptcy by going into this town. And you know what? This business venture didn't work. We have to start something new. Build a good foundation first and work from strength, not weakness. Last but not least, keep a sense of wonder. I looked it up, 67,000 miles an hour we're actually spinning around our axis around the sun. That's amazing we're even alive. So, I mean, how can, we stand, how can I stand still here 67,000 miles an hour, right? Why don't we float up? And if it's a magnetic field, why does wood stay down? I, all these crap, I don't understand. So the more I know, the less I know. Um, I hope you, uh, you were entertained and you learned, picked up a couple of things today. I will now open it up to Q&A. Out of all, all the times you've experienced failure, which one was the one you learned the most from? I think if, if I go back here, let's see, uh, this one. Uh, life, uh, this one. What is it, two inches in a graph? That was terrible that year for me. So our largest vendor walked away from us and we tried to keep them and they walked away from us and it was $80 million of the, the 180. So that was almost half my business. And I didn't know what to do, and I really didn't sleep, and I started drinking, I'm stressed, and then I thought, you know what? I can do this, because none of this is gonna solve my problem. So I decided to write a plan, what can I do? I can go out, visit new publishers, new vendors, and try to sign them up, and that's what I have to do. So instead of focusing my attention into something that wasn't productive, I tried to be productive and at least have a plan. Now, as you can see, that was very successful because those people who we signed up in that the years. But I didn't realize when you're, it, it, people say when you're fat and happy, it's like you sit there lazy, you become lazy. And it's very true. I sometimes believe that the U.S. too is, is a country that you should graduate to. If you've seen other countries and you're here, you, you, you really admire how much, how good it is here and how good it is in, 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 in a lot of other countries. And... Um, so I learned from, from, from just that 
super, super stressful time of like, I just took over in 06, I thought it was doing good, and boom, half your business is gone. And people look at you and say, okay, you're the leader, what do we do? So go towards productivity, not towards self-destruction. Yeah, so how do, how do big corporations like yours help the, the really hard things in the world? So how do we do that in the world, right? So I came here, and I was a lot of plastic, a lot of paper. Styrofoam stays with us. Actually, I think it never disintegrates, but at least 800 years or something like that. I walk around the, the building, printers everywhere. People have tchotchkes everywhere. We would buy plastic stuff to give to you that you would put on. And by the way, plastic balls, stupid little, terrible things. I walked in, I'm for the environment. What do we do? I just bought a building. It will be LEED certified gold. I will have solar panels on top. I'm trying to get geothermal heat. Um, we will have the most uh, eco-friendly carpet, furniture. Um, why do people work from home? Because you don't pollute if you by not driving to work. Um, super efficient servers. We have compost, uh, com uh, composting, so the, the, the garbage. I actually forbid plastic bottles. We're gonna forbid plastic bottles in our office because we have filtered water and we will buy expensive filters to filter the water. I don't understand why restaurants here in the US don't require that we just have normal drinking water. In Amsterdam and the Netherlands, you just drink water from a faucet. It's, it's simple. Uh, we should start by consuming less, but doing things a lot smarter and requiring that from our vendors too is great good. Yes? So you mentioned, so you mentioned um, that you're all about the environment, all about, for example, running your company in the most eco-friendly way. So how does your company compete against other companies that don't, aren't eco-friendly? Like you mentioned that place uh, that was, I guess, pretty terrible, that they're not doing, not taking the precautions or being sustainable. They're doing, they're strictly pure business. They're doing the cheapest costs. How do you, how does a U.S. company like you? Right. So first of all, I think, you know, one word about that, right? Did you ask, and we're talking about competing with uh, China. And by the way, it's, a, it's amazing too here in Stevens, right? I think that we were talking about that the new enrollments, like almost 50% of you are coming from China. That's amazing, but it says a lot too about the U.S., uh, this, the interest of STEM of U.S. students. But how do we compete with that? First of all, I think if I'm allowed to run 100 meters with steroids and you're not, you're going to lose. So I think it should be an equal set of rules. I think that if we import, uh, import anything, it should be under the same requirements manufactured as they require manufacturers in the US. Um, but I can say a lot, but I'm just one businessman in a small business actually. My, by the way, we do $400 million, which you might think is a lot. It's actually not that much because my next smallest competitor does 10 billion. I'm by far the smallest in my industry. Most of them do between 20 and 30 billion. So why don't we get crushed? Why do I try to do all these good things and we don't get crushed? It's because we're nimble. I don't spend money on a lot of nonsense stuff. I don't have to have a lot of lawyers, for instance, because I treat my employees well. And by showing them that we do good for the environment, people really buy in. This is our common dream. My, I, I, there's a saying in Germany that says, pay peanuts, get monkeys. I believe that. <laughs> if you don't believe that, go to, a, go to any... Uh, the, the, uh, fast food store where they pay people nothing, the manager doesn't know anything either. You come into these stores, nobody knows anything and you're just standing there terribly serviced. I believe if you pay people a little bit more and you train them well, I can have less people because they're bad, you're educated and they're, they're, they're excited about their job. And a lot of stuff is not financial, by the way. Yeah, I can't believe you, I can't believe how, how excited our employees were about a green roof and solar panels and the right sunlight. Why is this building closed? Right? Use a technology university. All day we have sunlight. Why, do we, why, do you, why don't we just break it up? Have sunlight come in. That kind of question. By the way, we'll save you money. The escalators in the store it drives me nuts. I would love to have a company that builds sensors. And by the way, you see Americans in Europe and in Japan, and it's so funny because they get up. Oh, the escalator is broken. No, it actually stops if there's no one's on there. <laughs> you can get on and it will start going. <laughs> It saves electricity. One escalator, 7,500 kilowatts an, an, a, a, a year. It's almost as much as a U.S. household. And all the stores go and go and go and go. This will be corrected, but it's the same thing as pensions. You can correct them now gradually, or you see in the Philippines what happens if you don't control population. 
if you don't address these problems. I try to do my thing and I try to keep a sense of wonder and not get myself down in terms of like these problems are too big. I will not pollute. I bike to work. I'm five miles from my work, I bike to work. I have cars, people are like, what? you have such a nice car, why do you bike to work? Because I love it. And if I set an example for people, hopefully people will follow. And Gandhi did the same thing. If Gandhi can do it, I can do it. Uh, okay, uh, one more thing, uh, uh, please. Thank Sorry. you. Applause for Simon. Great, great talk. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, before we move on with the uh, rest of the program, I'd like to present a, a, a small token of appreciation. Uh, let me just read this. Uh, presented to Simon Nimmons in appreciation of your contribution to the Thomas H. Scholl Lecture by Visiting Entrepreneurs at Stevens Institute of Technology, November 18th, 2015. Wow. Thank, Thank you so much. You.